and excited to introduce the the next moderator and the the next panelists to to dive into you know an issue that's really critical for all of us around innovation and platforms but also to talk about how all of this is uh, affecting and has been affected uh, by what we heard about from the the crowds at Vive and Hims around uh, diversity and inclusion and where some of these answers are for some of these uh, business models. We certainly did hear a lot about that at Vive and Hims. And to to take the conversation even further is Charlie Garland, a senior innovation fellow at Hit Lab, who will be talking with two extraordinary leaders in the ecosystem on this topic. Uh, Charles, the virtual platform is yours. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. This has uh, been terrific so far, and I am very happy and excited to welcome Ish Bala, the Medical Director of Behavioral Health at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, and Dr. Dr. Uh, Russ Robbins, the Chief Medical Officer at Purple Labs. Um, this is going to be a very exciting topic, something that's near and dear to my heart, too, uh, talking about things uh, that are affecting healthcare and that there are new and exciting and interesting uh, emerging technologies and innovations that are actually helping uh, the delivery of healthcare and the, and the health outcomes. And let me start um, uh, with a question for Ish. Ish, could you uh, just, first of all, introduce yourself very quickly, and, uh, and we can get to some questions around the work that you do. Yeah, hi, Charlie. Nice to, nice to be here, and thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ish Bala, and I'm a psychiatrist and a medical director at uh, Blue Cross North Carolina. And, and I, my role is really um, to expand our strategy around value-based care, uh, and particularly for, for people with behavioral health conditions um, and the co-occurring physical health conditions that kind of come along with behavioral health. We think it's really important here at Blue Cross North Carolina that we start thinking through ways of reimbursement for uh, beyond fee for service to really reward providers for um, for delivering high quality, high value care. And you know, in our few minutes today, I'd love to just kind of address how sometimes value based care can uh, have unintended consequences of disproportionately affecting people with um, uh, really really boosting up the quality and the value for for people that live in less vulnerable communities and and more resourced ones and um, that's something that I really took away from hims and something that I think is really an opportunity for health plans and innovation uh, innovative companies as well that's terrific let me let me even start by asking you what are some of the innovations and uh, tools that are typically available to uh, health insurers uh, to the payers for providing services in this way what are, what are you seeing that you that exists now and what are some of the emerging technologies yeah so what exists now is um it turns out health plans are are not very good commercial health plans are not very good at collecting demographic information on a member level so um really i'm talking about things like race and ethnicity uh, we're a little better at languages spoken because it's directly relevant to the healthcare experience but where we really struggle, I think, and, and that, that fortunately that area is emerging now is how to get good data to, um, to really understand members and, and vulnerable communities. So what we use now is, you know, of course we know where our members live. So we use, um, we use uh, census data to predict, you know, where, where members are gonna have the most vulnerabilities, living in food deserts, having, you know, several social determinants of health, um, and also predict, you know, based on census data, whether they're, whether, you know, what their race is. Um, but I think as we kind of get more sophisticated as a health plan industry, now with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's gonna become more and more interesting to, to leverage, you know, better data to, to go there. Um, we, that being said, we have developed a platform where we're measuring and rewarding providers based on their ability to close care gaps between um, you know, people living in vulnerable communities and non-vulnerable communities, which is something that we did for the first time in our uh, in our DEI or diversity strategy. So that's kind of where we're where we're headed. It's I think we're kind of in our infancy or our adolescence in terms of mm -hmm. doing this work. But um, you know, with with Russ and other companies that are kind of looking through uh, ways of delivering these kinds of you know social determinant data, I think we um, will eventually get there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we we don't have a place to start at this point. 
Perfect. That's a that's a great point, Ish, and thank you for that uh, segue to Russ, which I, I'd love to hear his perspectives from uh, from his own experience and from the the uh, Purple Labs um, uh, perspective. But first, Russ, could you just give us a, a real quick introduction to you and uh, and what your firm is doing? Absolutely, Charlie. Thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone, or good morning, depending or good evening, depending on where you are in the world listening to this webinar right now. So I am a physician by training, a urologist, was in private practice, left that to go into uh, healthcare informatics, get an MBA in health sciences, and, and along the way have done a lot with health and benefit, consulting, employer wellness, employee wellness, and always coming back to the data. That's always been the key. And what, you know, what I've seen over the, you know, the, the years that I've been doing this is you have the medical and the pharmacy claims information, but that's that's all we've ever had. And now with uh, what we're doing at Purple Lab in particular with social determinant of health and what I saw at HIMSS in terms of taking this other information outside of the claims itself, but being able to tie it back to the treating physician, to the prescriptions, you really start gaining lots of new insights on what's going on in the in the in the healthcare arena. And you know, and that to me was, you know, interesting as I was walking around and listening to the lectures at HIMSS was, you know, there's a lot of people who have that interest and some are just beginning. And then there are others, you know, who've been thinking about this for a long time. But now we're actually at the point where we can take this real world data and make it actionable. And that's what we've developed at Purple Lab is a whole platform where you can actually do that in real time. That's that's really exciting, Russ, and I appreciate that perspective because, as Ish mentioned, we really are in the infancy of the adoption of this new level of insight, which is, quite frankly, uh, it 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 promises to change drastically and significantly the effectiveness of healthcare delivery by virtue of looking at at the patient and the patient's lives through a whole new lens that was never considered before. And I'm just curious, from your perspective, how is that being adopted by treatment providers currently? Are they, are they willing to accept and how are they changing their thinking? How are they changing their, their actual uh, behavior as far as how they're treating patients? Yeah, no, you know, it's interesting, you know, obviously we're getting, you know, some pushback from, you know, the status quo because it's easier not to make change. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, I have books on my shelf uh, behind me from 20 some odd years ago that are, I guess, innovative because none of the uh, recommendations have been adopted as of yet. So we're still talking <laughs> about them. But it's really, I think at this point, you know, the health plans in particular, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, the healthcare providers, and most importantly, the patients are interested in understanding where can I get high quality cost from physicians who have good outcomes, good scores, and, you know, good patient uh, mix. And then more importantly, now, you know, it's really how do I find if, you know, if it's important, how do I find physicians who are taking care of people who look like me, look like my family, so they can relate to what my concerns are and not just kind of ignore them and, uh, you know, just move past them. So I think, you know, that's really where the interest that we're getting is coming, you know, from our data is we can look at physician practices, we can look at individual physicians and see what, what their patient population looks like, not the actual patients, but we know what the demographics are and we can then look to see how do they compare to others in their area or in the mm -hmm. state or nationally. It's, that's really using digital information in a very smart way and, and uh, uh, all, all the uh, good speed to you in, in making that happen. It's, it sounds like you're doing great things. Ish, you had talked a little bit about the uh, what you're doing. You're taking a real leadership role at uh, Blue Cross with regards to uh, evolving or shifting the, the payment models. Can you talk a little bit more about that and the vision that you guys share? Yeah, so, um, you know, we... At Blue Cross North Carolina, we're really focused on, like I said, the, for for behavioral health. It's it's um, uh, we kind of lag behind for several reasons. Uh, we lag behind physical health in terms of being able to deliver high value care. For example, a lot of providers that I know, my colleagues, um, therapists, psychiatrists, etc., aren't really used to being measured on quality. Actually, we're not even really used to being paid in a in an insurance framework because a lot of people with behavioral health needs go out of network and get cash pay. Um, we think that that, well, I think that that's a problem because 
in and of itself, that's a, that's a driver of disparities. What, what we're doing though, is that we've seen that there's, there's gaps in quality for really around coordination of care to be able to provide uh, well-coordinated care. For example, when someone gets discharged from the hospital, are they getting a follow-up appointment? If they go to an ER for you know, a panic attack, are they getting, you know, which is very easily treated as an outpatient, are they able to get a you know, well-coordinated treatment within seven days, you know, which is a very measurable thing through claims. But we see that depending on where you live and your income and the type of health plan that you have, even if you do have commercial insurance, it's difficult to, to get those kinds of uh, coordination, uh, well-coordinated care happening. I think with data will help, um, for example, flagging, flagging members that, that do have particular vulnerabilities that we've, as we've defined and then, and then incentivizing and really paying providers to pay attention to those discrepancies. Because as of now, in a fee-for-service framework, it's really easy for providers to just kind of take on the patients that are easiest to take on and not really pay attention to the disparities. And that's really where we think that alternative payment models and really being smarter about the way we, we reimburse can help improve, um, improve quality and reduce cost and, and really improve health over time. That's terrific. It sounds like you're empowering uh, providers to be a little bit more proactive and even predictive. Do you have you have predictive models that you're using to help uh, identify prospective patients in need? Yeah, we've done some internal analyses to predict patients that will eventually need uh, you know mental health treatment. Um, you know, but it's somewhat of a blunt tool still, since we are really looking at claims, and you know, we look at pharmacy claims and. Uh, 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 you know, therapy, physical health claims as well. And it, it turns out that we can predict some, some spend. Um, but like I said, like there's nothing like a clinical interview with a member that, you know, we don't know about yet, but is struggling with, uh, or, 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 you know, has a heroin use problem or something in their homes. And we don't, we wouldn't really know that until something bad happens if they come into the ER with an infection or something. So that's kind of where, where we, I, I think you said it right, Charlie, that we're trying to empower providers, which I think is what they want to get one lump payment and then really get rewarded for savings rather than just how many times they see a patient. That's, that's great. Along the lines of uh, empowering providers, let's go back to Russ for a second. And uh, Russ, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing now and what you see as sort of your, your key uh, objective in the, near, in the near future, as far as what you're the challenges you're overcoming and uh, and where Purple Labs is taking that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Charlie. So I think, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is, you know, providers and their practice patterns. What are they doing? How are they treating patients? And really, what is some of the information? You know, so like, if you look at behavioral health as a perfect example of, you know, are the are, you know, with the lack of behavioral health specialists around, you know, with, there's a lot of other people taking care of, uh, of people with behavioral health, primary care physicians, other, phys uh, other types of providers, and, you know, how are their practices and what are their, what are their practice patterns looking like compared to other people? So it's a way, to, again, to look at this. And then more importantly, as you start looking at the pharmaceutical uh, drugs that are being, uh, uh, the prescriptions being written is, you know, we have the ability to look to see who's getting the prescription, who isn't getting the prescription and why, you know? So is it that it's uh, due to a socioeconomic factor? Is it due to race or ethnicity? And so we can see not only rejection rates, but also abandonment rates, like who is filling the prescription, but never going to the pharmacy to pick it up? And how does that impact healthcare and what needs to be done in order to improve it? And, you know, our whole philosophy is really just making real world data actionable. So it's whatever we can do from our platform, from our clients, from other people using it is really how do we provide the research and the ability to look critically at the data and then make some real world changes with that. That's great. Russ, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And please, everyone connect with uh, both Russ and Ish. Uh, the, the links are in the chat window and uh, they would love to continue the conversation with you more. <clears throat> Outstanding, Charlie. And thank you for uh, moderating such a terrific panel and, and be sure to say hi to your brother Merrick for me when you talk to him again. <laughs> Outstanding. So uh, from uh, diversity and inclusion to uh, discussing some of the finer details around 
uh, what we're seeing in uh, in digital health with clinical research. But first, we have another round for our uh, book giveaway. Uh, I should say Paul's book giveaway, uh, The Fourth Wave, The Digital Health, uh, A New Era in uh, Human Progress. Uh, so here comes the, the trivia question for everyone to jump into. Remember, the first one to hit the right answer in the chat box wins the book. So uh, without me even reading the question, we already have about 100 responses. You guys are good. You guys are really good. I have to hand it to this audience. Um, how much did virtual uh, increase in 21 compared to pre-COVID baseline? And we're talking, of course, about virtual health, 16 times, 38 times, or 64 times. And it'd be interesting to actually get the, the poll numbers here. But um, uh, the, the correct answer was B, Jordan Rose was the first one out of the gates on that one. Uh, it's like watching the Kentucky Derby. Well done, Jordan. And again, uh, Jerry Antomano, the production manager for the program here today, will be in touch with you about your personalized signed copy from uh, Professor Paul Sonnier. 